We have um, a fabulous speaker tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce um, uh, Clint Bybee, who's um, not just uh, a fabulous speaker, but a personal friend, and I'm so delighted he's here. Let me tell you a little bit about Clint. Clint Bybee is a co-founder and managing director of Arch Venture Partners. He has helped organize, finance, and build numerous companies out of university and national lab laboratory uh, research, including mi micro-optical devices, founded out of Sandia National Laboratories, Cambrios Technologies in Overlight, both founded out of UT Austin, Silura Technologies in, from MIT, Semprius from the University of Illinois, Nanosys from Harvard and UC Berkeley, Coolridge Light Sextera Communications from the University of Michigan, M, uh, Impinge from the University of Washington, and many, many others, more numerous than we can say tonight. He leads Archer's initiative with the Department of Energy at Sandia National Labs, and Archer's LabStar initiative at Los Alamos National Labs. He is a board member of numerous private companies and is a founding board member of the Texas Venture Capital Association, and I can say personally was instrumental behind the Texas Venture Capital Association, and currently serves as its first president. Mr. Bybee holds an MBA from the University of Chicago and a BS in Petroleum Engineering from Texas A&M University. Arch Ventures is one of the largest seed venture capital um, operating funds nationally in the US, founded in the mid-1980s and now managing over $1.5 billion in assets. Arch specializes in co-founding and building companies around research emanating from major academic research universities, national laboratories, along with corporate research labs in the US, and indeed overseas now, as you have overseas offices. We do, yeah. And so uh, we welcome Clint here tonight. And uh, Clint, I'd like to kind of kick off by asking you, um, the, the theme tonight is IP to IPO. You're a very unusual fund who is very comfortable investing in intellectual property, and you take it all the way to IPO that I think you recently had with a company. Uh, we did, actually. We had a biotech company that got public a couple of weeks ago, which uh, is a rare event these days, so it's nice to see when that happens. Um, so what I thought I'd do tonight, uh, just uh, to, so I have some sense of, of uh, the audience. Um, Laura told me there was likely to be some undergraduate students, some graduate students, some um, other members of the community at large. Could I just see a hand, uh, show of hands of the undergraduates in here? Okay, thank you. And the graduate students? Or postdocs? Or, or, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's a different group. But, uh, um, and uh, those that are, are not a student anymore, but uh, a student of social or human behavior? Okay, <laughs> yep, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you, Laura, for inviting me here, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I thought what I'd try to do tonight is, uh, is give you just a little bit of background about, uh, about Arch so you have some context of, of how we got started and why we focus on what we do. And then talk about um, um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the ways we approach building companies out of academic uh, research labs and some of the things we think about. And I'll, and I'll try to, to abstract that at a high enough level. I think there's some principles in there, whether you're doing a, a company based on a core set of patents or you're doing some other type of company. I think there's some common themes in there. Uh, so just uh, briefly, uh, we got started back in the middle 80s at the University of Chicago, um, really uh, organized originally by the trustees of the university uh, as a group called Arch Development Corporation with a mission to start companies out of research emanating from the University of Chicago and the Argonne National Laboratory, which the university operates for the U.S. Department of Energy. And there were some several members of the trustees that really believed that the way to commercialize technology was to put entrepreneurs um, um, at risk to succeed or fail, and, uh, and then to try to do everything you could to help them succeed. And that was really the, the genesis of, uh, of Arch, and that's how we got started. And by the late 1980s, we had started a few companies out of uh, both Argonne 
couple of advanced materials companies out of Argonne and some biotech companies out of the University of Chicago, which sort of reflects the strengths of the two institutions, physical sciences and life sciences. And um, we couldn't find any uh, seed venture money for these companies. And, uh, and uh, so we concluded that we really, in order to kind of continue this experiment, because it really was set up as a sort of an academic experiment initially, in order to, to continue the experiment, we needed to, to have some seed investment capability. And so we raised an initial fund in 1989 of uh, $9 million, which seems pathetically small these days, but it was the hardest money we as a group will ever raise. Uh, and uh, uh, we got told many times that our track record was all ahead of us, which uh, is probably true. And, um, and uh, sort of fast forward to today, we've now, as a group, been together for 25 or so years. We've uh, managed uh, our current fund is our seventh fund. We manage about a billion and a half dollars in capital. And um, you know, we've had some nice successes along the way. We've had some spectacular failures and some that have come in between. But, uh, um, but uh, you know, by and large, we've continued to focus on innovations at uh, leading academic research uh, institutes as the, as the primary source of new company ideas for us. And part of the reason we do that is because that's where we came from. And, and so our, our first thought of, uh, of an of a opportunity relates to, you know, what's the technology behind it? What's the intellectual property behind it? But, but part of it is just pragmatic. The, the, uh, uh, the federal dollars flowing through academic institutions, both uh, research universities and federal laboratories, is something on the order of 70 to 100 billion dollars a year. It's a fairly steady state. It doesn't go up during boom cycles dramatically. It doesn't go down during recessions dramatically. And so the pace of innovation is fairly steady. And, um, and it's the, the case our belief, the, the case that the big innovations in the life sciences, the big innovations in the physical sciences, um, really by and large occur at the academic institutions and, and, uh, and the academic laboratories. And uh, so for us, it's a great source of new company ideas. I mean, our real job is to find the, the you know, the crazy, smart, creative, innovative researcher that's pushing forward some envelope of science in a dramatic and disruptive way. That's really what we're looking for. And, 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 and so on the, 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 the that, that really gets to my next point. Disruptive innovations is, is, is what we're looking for. Things that are, that are um, entirely new ways of of thinking about things. I, I'm going to talk about some of our companies by way of example just to give you a, 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 an example of some of these things. But uh, um, big improvements in materials performance, 100x, 1,000x better. We have a, a company that uh, is an example that's in the memory area built around some materials work at, uh, originally at Arizona State and with some other IPN that uh, is uh, producing a, um, a uh, memory that will, will use a thousand, maybe more than that, a thousand X less power than, uh, than the current flash memory. Um, so, you know, th th these are the kinds of innovations that, that, that really excite us. Um, so one of the first areas when, when the, 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 one of the first ways we think about you know, big innovations is, is, is uh, an, an approach, a scientific discovery is to, is to do what my partners and I describe as market discovery. It is, um, it is um, often the case that an academic researcher will have uh, some crazy incredible idea and um, be working on an application that may have nothing to do with what the real commercial application is all about. And, and, and I'll give you a, a couple of examples of that. Um, 
back in 2001, I met a researcher here at the University of Texas, um, a woman named Angela Belcher. And Angie was, uh, had, had developed a whole body of uh, research, really pioneered an area of engineering the DNA in a bacteriophage or a, or a virus to have it assim to, to, and to use that to assemble or synthesize inorganic materials. Uh, it, was, it, it, was a, it was a completely orthogonal approach to how do you make nanomaterials, how do you assemble alloys of materials. And she had done some stunts in her laboratory on kind of ideas on applications, but, but there was really no insight into what the commercial application for that might be. And, uh, but it was the coolest thing we had ever seen. You know, to, to be able to take the diversity that biology has evolved over billions of years and apply that to an area of emerging importance in commercial applications. And so we uh, organized a company um, with Angie and, and her collaborator, Evelyn Hu from uh, UC Santa Barbara, and um, uh, formed a company with the goal of taking out a white sheet of paper initially. This was, this was the original business plan. We'll take out a white sheet of paper. We'll hire uh, a really s smart couple, two, two or three people, <clears throat> and, and we'll go find the commercially relevant application, process of market discovery. You know, getting out, getting primary research, getting in front of, of a whole variety of, of um, potential customers in a variety of different industries to help us figure out where the big pony is. And, if, and if, the, if at the end of that it's not successful, then so be it. But our belief was there was a big application there. And that ultimately led us to um, uh, the, an application of, uh, of uh, making a transparent conductor material. Um, and we now have a company that's raised over $50 million in capital from uh, venture investors and strategic investors, and is now designed into a number of smartphones and other uh, products uh, that, that use uh, touch sensors. And thanks to uh, Steve Jobs, touch is cool, and that, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a great benefit to us. Um, along the way, we concluded there are so many interesting applications from Angie's work that there was probably another company in there too. So a couple of years ago, we spun out the, uh, the Belcher um, IP estate um, in, into, a, into a new company and really started with the same business plan, white sheet of paper, smart guy, and uh, you know six to nine months of uh, lead time to go sort through potential applications. And he and, and, uh, and a couple of the folks he had hired came back and said, you know, we think it's catalysis. We think there's a way to use this novel capability of of uh, um, biology and materials to do some uh, dramatic discoveries and catalysis. And, um, and so, and, and, and we asked them what catalytic ideas they had, and they had some, and we weren't sure those were really big enough. And uh, so we asked them to go back and think about bigger ideas, and they came back and they said, okay, there's a problem that stumped academics and researchers for 30 years a process called oxidative coupling of methane, or OCM, ability to convert methane to ethylene. Ethylene is a $160 billion a year chemical intermediate product. And we said, OK, that's a big enough opportunity. Let's go, <laughs> let's, let, 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 let's go work on that. And methane, obviously, is a very cost advantage feedstock these days with all of the shale gas. And, and so our, our hypothesis, and that's all it was, was um, this, uh, the, the Belcher suite of tools would allow us to create some alloys of catalysts that people had not thought about or created before. And so we coupled that capability with a uh, high throughput screening set of capabilities, kind of borrowed that intuition from biotechnology, but allowed us to, to Angie's technology allowed us to make hundreds of different catalysts very quickly the high throughput screening allowed us to evaluate hundreds of catalysts very quickly at temperature, at pressure, at reaction conditions. And as a result, we were able to screen thousands of catalysts, um, potential catalysts, and now have <coughs> an economic process 
and solution to OCM that has stumped academics and researchers for 30 years. Uh, we've completed a pilot uh, scale of this. It works. It's efficient. We'll have a commercial demonstration. Um, we'll be at the commercial demonstration uh, ne next year. So an example of um, starting with, with cool, really cool, there must be an application, and then it's a matter of putting a team together, giving them the, the rope and the leash and the encouragement and the insight and the feedback to go figure out a, a, a commercial application. One other um, example, I, I, and I wrote down several, I won't bore you with um, all of them, I, but, but, but another one that's, that's, that's interesting and, and, and it's made it all the way through IPO so I can be faithful to the, the <laughs> title of the talk, um, is a company called Illumina. And this one um, came out of, originally out of a laboratory of a chemist at Tufts University, a fellow named David Walt. And David had been funded by DARPA to put together an electronic nose. DARPA was interested in a way to find landmines. And uh, so David's idea was to use uh, beads and fibers. And, uh, and it worked great in the laboratory. But when you got out in the air with pollen and all sorts of other stuff, the signal to noise was terrible. And, and, it, uh, and it was a disaster in that application. But. Um, we and a, and a few others who were um, organizing the company um, concluded that uh, what, what David really had was a, a, a kind of a super sensitive detector. And, <clears throat> and there was an application in genomics and proteomics in a way to potentially use this to um, dramatically drive the cost down of doing um, genomics and proteomics, 100x, 1,000x cheaper. And so that was the basis of, uh, um, the, that was the hypothesis behind Illumina. And in fact, today Illumina is uh, the market leader in genomic and proteomic tools. It trades with a market cap of around $6 billion and has been a phenomenal success coming all the way from David's lab at, uh, at Tufts. Um, focused on an electronic nose that DARPA funded to a uh, really compelling commercial enterprise. Um, um, again, kind of the market discovery piece. The second theme that we spend a lot of time thinking about is intellectual property. Um, and in the case of Cambrios and Soluria around Angie's work, you know, we started with a uh, Angie was a pretty prolific uh, patenter here at the University of Texas, and then she went on to MIT, and she's continued to be a prolific patenter there. And, and, uh, so, and, and, and there really weren't peers and competitors that Angie had at other academic institutions. But it's often the case that there are, that a leading researcher at University of Texas will have colleagues, competitors, whatever you want to call them, at other leading academic institutions that are, that are all sort of focused on figuring out the solution to a particular really interesting area. And um, it's, it's often the case if you can figure out a way to get two or three or all of the leaders as co-founders of a company together and bringing in their IP um, then, then, then there's a way to build a much broader platform from the outset, um, a, a much broader intellectual property platform. And one of the things that, that we're trying to create is, is we look at startup companies and that you know, all entrepreneurs should be thinking about is, how do I create an unfair competitive advantage? Um, particularly in the landscape of, of uh, you know, getting technology to marketplace, there's often you're com competing in a land of giants. And so you want to figure out a way to have these giants have to come work with you if they want to work in this area. And uh, a couple of examples in, in that area, we have a, a company called Agios Pharmaceuticals. It's working in an area called cancer metabolism. It's actually a very old area, old idea, but with 
a lot of new insights over the last uh, several years. And three of the absolute leading researchers in this area, pioneers, uh, are a fellow named Tack Mack from uh, University of Toronto, Lou Cantley from uh, Harvard Medical School, and, and um, hang on, I wrote this down because I knew I'd, forget, I'd uh, block on it. Craig Thompson, who's the current CEO of the, uh, um, the uh, Sloan Kettering, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And um, so, so when uh, Agios was organized, um, we brought all three of these researchers together in their IP, and we've since added others as scientific advisors and licensed their technology, really with the goal of, of creating an unfair competitive advantage in this area of cancer metabolism. If companies, our, our hypothesis was this is an important area, an area that pharmaceutical companies are going to care about, and we want them to have to partner with us or to buy our company for a lot of money if they want to work in this area of cancer metabolism. And that led fairly early on, you know, we formed a venture syndicate. <coughs> um, but but um, within the first year, the company was able to do a partner deal with a pharmaceutical company called Celgene for $130 million, most of it non-equity, a teeny bit equity, uh, but all of it cash. It wasn't bio dollars that tend to be kind of uh, Make, make believe future stuff. It was real cash. And, um, and, and it was entirely because Celgene absolutely wanted to work in the area of cancer metabolism. And the way that they saw clear to do that was to work with Agios. And, uh, and uh, frankly, what they saw in Agios was an ability to get a lot more done more quickly than they imagined they could do inside of a, a larger pharmaceutical organization. Another, um, just another example, how am I doing on time, Laura? You're doing fine, you're just, um, about another five minutes or less. Okay, I'll going. skip another example on that, but there's a, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> you, you, you get the idea, right? It's, it's, it's uh, um, if there's a way to look beyond um, the, you know, the, you know, your research, if you're the, the researcher and imagine bringing in other research or other uh, intellectual property. That is one of the fundamental assets of a technology company is, is the IP. <clears throat> so let me ask you that. You've got the fundamental IP. Um, you've gone through the market discovery program um, or process that you've developed. Um, at that point, you're ready to, f you actually form the company with the researchers, correct? In, in <coughs> most of the cases. Sometimes there's an entrepreneur there, many times there's not. So then, so then if there's not, then usually step one is to go find the entrepreneur, find the, the, you know, the CEO, the leader that's going to help, that's going to build the team. And then when you <coughs> find that, you're ready to fund the company? Yeah, sometimes we'll fund it before we find that person. Um, you know, sometimes to do the market discovery, uh, it, it uh, you know, you, you, you got to get a company started and you got to put a little seed money in, kind of put the toe in the water, so to speak, to know how cold it is. And, uh, and, and so, you know, sometimes you got to get a little momentum behind it to, to uh, um, and, and, and in fact, that's, uh, Laura mentioned Lab Start, which is our experiment with uh, Los Alamos. And uh, this was uh, the, uh, experiment was was really geared towards you know can we do more startups out of research at Los Alamos the funding at Los Alamos is something approaching four billion dollars a year what's on budget there's off budget stuff too and um, and um, the the hypothesis is something interesting must come out of that right and uh, um, but we hope uh, so yeah no and, and, and in fact it, it's it, it is the case but uh, LabStart was really formed to be a, a, a company starting engine. And we've now started, uh, we, we have an excellent guy on the ground there, a guy named Tom Brennan, who I've worked with for 20 years, and he's fantastic. Um, but he's started 18 companies now. And they're all experiments. One of them's raised a lot of venture money. One of them likely will raise venture money in the next six months. One of them has a chance to raise some serious money if a couple of the experiments prove to be successful. Um, but um, 
you know, I would say, you know, we sort of view it, we're, we're, we, you know, we, you, you got to be experimental in this. You know, not everything is going to work, but um, lots of, having lots of shots on goal is part of our business, we've learned. And, uh, you know, and, and, and my partners and I really try to approach this as, um, you know, kind of a swing for the fence mentality. There are, you know, some venture funds that, 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 that don't look at it that way, that look more, you know, they want, they want to have a low mortality rate. And so they're, they're you know, we're, we're less concerned about that. And we want to really try to fund big ideas, things that, that really, if they succeed, can succeed in a, in a, in a very big way. So when you look at the big ideas, and again, back to the market discovery process, what's the kind of, I know every technology is different and every company is different, but do you look at a minimum size of market that you won't even consider investing a company? You know, you mentioned there was a $160 billion opportunity. Um, is, is there a market size below which you perceive that it's not worth doing any investment? There aren't very many $160 billion right. markets. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I think it, it certainly helps to imagine the market measured in billions mm -hmm. rather than hundreds of millions. And um, um, the, um, you know, our current fund is a $400 million fund. We, you know, when we go into these companies, we at least try to convince ourselves <coughs> that there's a way to build a company that that can you know be sold for you know hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. But so. you you might start in, in that company. You may start with half a million or a million syndicated before you get up to the more significant investment. A absolutely, we've we've made an investment. Uh, one of the companies we did out of Los Alamos. <coughs> uh, you know, sometimes we'll jump in as initial management, not because we think we're qualified to do that, but uh, because um, it's just us and the academic, and the academic's got no interest in doing that, and so um, so as a way to get things started, um, you know, we'll jump in and do that until we can recruit somebody that knows better what they're doing. And um, and uh, so we don't trust ourselves with very much money. So when, when we jump in as the initial management, we you know the funding is really small. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we did a company like that out of uh, Los Alamos, and our initial funding was twenty-five thousand dollars. We needed to test a few hypotheses, run a few experiments. We actually started a company <coughs> with um, an academic at University of Illinois. Um, we had some ideas. We had followed the solid-state lighting area. Uh, my colleague who's now in Europe, Paul Turk, and I, uh, we followed the solid state lighting area for a long time, had some what we believe were well-formed ideas on what really would matter there, and we just couldn't find it, either from the technology side or from, you know, entrepreneurs that we, uh, we met. And, uh, but we had some ideas actually based on some technologies at one of our other companies. And... Um, so we ran, we talked the researcher into running some experiments. He has a very well-funded laboratory, had extra folks he could put on the experiment, and, uh, and we put um, about $5,000 of funding in, and the experiments worked well enough to convince us that, that we, uh, we had an opportunity. So, and on the flip side, um, um, you know, some of these companies, you really got to get some critical mass of funding behind them for, to be able to... Uh, build the right team quickly enough and recruit the, the you know, kind of the superstar team that you want. Most biotech companies are, sort of fit that description where, you know, you sort of got to go big or go home kind of from the beginning. So we think about bigger, syndi bigger syndicates and bigger initial funding rounds, and that may look like two or three million or seven or eight or ten or, um, you know, 12 or 15 million, just depending on the circumstances. How, how do you go about finding that, that entrepreneurial leader, that CEO? Is it out of your own network or the partners' networks? Do you hire recruiters? How do you find them? We, um, you know, the initial CEO, um, you know, a lot of them are out of our network. It hadn't always been that case. When you've been in the business 25 years, turns out you have a network. <laughs> um, when you're just getting started, it's, uh, you know, it's harder to have the entrepreneurial network. Um, but, you know, we now have, you know, anytime we have a successful entrepreneur, CEO, we always try to make a comfortable place for him or her to come hang out while they're thinking about their next thing to do. 
and we try to keep them busy with ideas of, uh, that are coming down our pipe. And, uh, and so we have probably a half dozen people hanging around Arch right now that, are in, that kind of fit that description. One of the fellows, uh, Ned David, has, start, has been the founder of six or seven companies. Five have gone public so far. Um, he's a big thinker. He's our kind of guy. And, um, um, but, um, it, you know, they don't always come out of our network. Sometimes we'll, um, they'll come out of the network of our syndicate partners. And so we like working with other smart, creative investors that have other ideas on teams and people. Um, and sometimes we'll find them through, through a recruiting situation. You know, generally, um, generally the great executives are most interested in the really big disruptive ideas. Um, you know, they're, and, and, and so in some sense, if we're doing our job right and putting together, you know, leading academics around big ideas and big opportunities, then we should be able to, to find a, uh, um, a, you know, really compelling team to, to build around it. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask you all to think about questions and go to the mic while I ask Clint to answer this, this question. Um, IP to IPO, what's a typical time frame? Is there a typical time frame? That's a great question. Um, you know, the IPO market's been a tough place the last uh, decade or so. And, um, but in general, the, you know, the time frame from starting companies out of the laboratory to having a company that is, uh, Laura and I were involved with a company that uh, came out of uh, the University of Texas, a chemical engineering laboratory of uh, Brian Corgill here. <coughs> and um, um, uh, a synthesis capability to make uh, silicon nanomaterials. And um, about a year ago, uh, maybe this month, a year ago, um, it was acquired by uh, DuPont. And um, and that was what a seven or eight seven or, seven and a half yeah, yeah yeah a seven year endeavor and um, you know it'd be great if uh, if it was a three year endeavor it'd be okay if it was a five year endeavor but you know in truth to go from lab scale particularly if the um, if the you know the big market is not yet identified and there's a period of wandering in the wilderness to figure out you know where the big pony is. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think realistically it's a seven to nine year endeavor. Um, and, um, and there's, you know, there's, there's outliers on either side of that. So I'm on the board, for example, of a company called Impinge, <coughs> which we started at the University of Washington in 19... 98, maybe, or seven, uh, seems like forever ago. Um, Impinge is, is now the market leader in Gen 2 RFID, um, um, and uh, in, in Gen 2 RFID chips. We'll sell over a billion RFID chips this year. Um, we're uh, market leader in reader chips. We acquired the reader chip group out of Intel, and uh, um, we're a significant market share in readers and reader systems. And so, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic company. We just haven't exited out of it yet. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's a, there, there's a real business that's emerged out of the academic lab at University of Washington, but, but, uh, but, but it hadn't resulted in an IPO or some other exit yet. The company did file a S1 uh, a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, but uh, you know, the IPO windows are short and cantankerous and, and finicky, and we weren't able to, to get it out during that opportunity, and so we're chugging along. Sounds like it'll go out again. That happens. Questions you may have. Good evening. Hi. I'm a law student here at UT. I have a question on behalf of the students here in the audience. It seems like the career path for you and your partners were from engineering and science backgrounds to uh, an MBA. Well, what other career paths can we take to uh, maybe one day work at a VC firm? 
<clears throat> the, um, you know, I'll tell you, um, when I was doing my um, MBA at the University of Chicago, when I, I, I was a, I had been a heads down engineer, which, you know, means I didn't really know much about uh, business. I, you know, I had no idea what a venture, I didn't know what a management consultant was, I didn't know what a, a you know, I had no idea there was such a thing as venture capital. You know, it wasn't my aspiration to become a venture capital, it just, you know, I happened to be on the ground when this entity was getting organized and it seemed like a really cool idea to go work on startup companies out of Argonne National Laboratory and kind of get my hands in the patient and, uh, and figure out, you know, what that was like and that wound up led me to help start a couple of advanced materials company. Both of them wound up going public. Neither would you necessarily want to own in your own portfolio, but, uh, um, but it, was a, it was a great way to get, get started. So my advice to you really is follow your passion. And, and, if, it's, and if it's venture capital investing, then, then, you know, then, then follow that as a passion. But, but uh, it's, it's most important, I think, to, to find an endeavor that you're really excited about doing every day. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Bruce. Uh, I just had two questions for you. The first one is, I know a lot of VC firms are very hesitant to invest in biotech and medical companies just because of the long clinical trial times. What would you say is the most reassuring aspect uh, that you get from just waiting and on these investments uh, throughout like the seven through nine years like you mentioned? And also with, that, with working with these small research companies, at what point distinguishes uh, these great ideas from becoming patents or trademark secrets? I don't think I understand the last part of your, your question. Can you try that uh, again? Just referencing back to a few <laughs> weeks back, uh, Gail from uh, Vermilion, she had said that uh, they had kept their software for uh, keeping the blood markers a trademark secret, but the rest of their ideas they kept as patents. Oh, the, so, so the distinction yes. between um, know-how or tra or, uh, versus patenting things? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, th th that's a, um, um, you know, that's a debate that you wind up having in, 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 in every company and it's different in every company. I think there are a lot of things um, that our process is that get developed, how do you mix something in a certain way, how do you, what's the order of addition of materials to make a certain product just the right way, the same every time. That's all stuff that you probably don't want to patent because you don't really want to teach people how to do that. You'd like to just keep that in, in, in house. But fund, you know, fundamentally making an app, making a product with metal nanowires, I'm thinking now of our company Cambrios, making a product with metal, nan metal nanowires that's a transparent conducting material and conducts with a resistivity of less than 50 ohms per square centimeter. So that, that is what you would want to patent because then if, if it, that's easy to detect in the marketplace. You can rip something apart, look at a layer. If it, if it infringes on your patent, then, 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 then it, it's easy to, to identify that. Uh, whereas how somebody made the material may be more difficult. Um, and, and now that I've answered that, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the first part of your the question. The first question so, was uh, the reassuring aspect of investing in biotech and medical companies due to the long clinical oh, trial times. Well, the, um, so the, the, um, you know, the most obvious reassuring part is that um, the, um, you know, if a, product goes to market by in the biotech area, by definition, you're helping some slice of humanity, right? Which is, 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 is the gratifying thing about all of these companies to see them deliver product that somehow makes people's lives better. Uh, one of our early biotech companies we invested in was a company called um, Averon. And uh, in fact, I'm on a couple of boards with the founding CEO of that company um, <clears throat> today. And Averon was a company that really pioneered uh, the work in what became Flumist. It was acquired, went public, and then Metamune acquired uh, Averon. 
and then brought flu mist to market. And, um, um, and if, if you have kids, you will appreciate the value of flu mist um, as a way to deliver the annual flu vaccine versus taking your daughter in to, to subject her to a shot. So, so, so that's the obvious benefit. The other thing I would say is it's really gratifying to, um, um, to go um, to a company where there was nothing originally and to have a hundred or two hundred or a thousand employees, you know, all of whom are, are, you know, taking care of families and and contributing to the economy. To have a small part in that is uh, is a is, is a very gratifying thing. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Van, undergraduate at the Macomb School of Business. Thank you again for uh, being with us tonight. I was just wondering what the market discovery process looked like in like the six months. What what would that what would that entail, and what what kinds of things do you, does Arch do um, during that time? Um, so I would say it's a uh, the market discovery process is you know sort of an iterative iterative interactive process, right? You have to start with <coughs> with some hypotheses about what application areas make sense. Um, and so, um, but, I, but, it, but you also have to keep an open mind and sort of continue to be creative and then get out and, and find companies that will talk to you. And you know, if you imagine that, that you have something that's valuable for semiconductor companies, for example, you want to get out and talk to, figure out a way in to research folks at Intel or Novellus or, or Applied Materials and and, uh, um, you know, and if they throw you out, then, okay, fine. There's information content there. This is not a promising area. Let's go think about other, uh, other application areas. Um, and that's really how we started at, at Cambrio. So our thinking was we had a really important innovation in the semiconductor materials area and concluded that we might, but um, these companies are going to be too difficult to work with. They're too big and too conservative. And they were scared to death of the idea of having a virus on their wafers. And, uh, and so we needed to go find somebody else to, uh, some other application to imagine working with. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. This is kind of touching on um, one of the questions two questions ago. But um, looking at the obstacles faced when bringing a biotech or pharma uh, product to market, what CROs, clinical research organizations, do you trust and respect most and why? That's a great question. I'm not really the guy to probably answer that. Um, uh, I'm, um, while I can um, uh, talk a little bit of biotechnology, I have partners that are steeped in it to a great degree, and they focus on the biotech side of things. Um, and so they would have an idea there for you. I, I don't really uh, have great insights there. Okay. Thank you. So do all the partners specialize in certain areas more than others? We do. Um, you know, we tend to divide the world in um, life sciences and physical sciences. And I'm more of a physical sciences guy. Things that, that uh, um, um, you know, move electrons or photons or RF energy or things that I tend to understand better and can imagine applications and know a lot of people in the application space. And then I have um, some partners that focus almost all their time on, on uh, biotech and, and, uh, and innovations there. And I notice you also do some IT? We do some IT. We don't do much IT. So we've, um, you know, we've missed the whole social media thing. All these things are happening around us and we know nothing about them. And, uh, um, um, we, um, Please, for those of you tweeting, don't tweet that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting opportunities in that sector. It's not a sector that we happen to, to uh, have expertise in where we feel like we have a competitive advantage, if you will, is in um, um, deep technology companies. Um, largely in the life sciences and physical sciences, and, and in areas where information sciences 
um, you know, broadens the application space for life sciences or physical sciences. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Uh, in my laboratory, uh, we do a lot of work with ion transporters, and uh, most of the applications that we've been looking at uh, happen to be in biomedical sciences uh, because, you know, everything in cells have to maintain very uh, exact concentrations of ions, and if you just disrupt these, then either good or bad things can happen. But uh, just thinking about things, it seems like there should be some very good physical applications for these because certainly with batteries, there's a lot of ion transport. And I was wondering if mm -hmm. you would have any uh, good ideas or uh, associated with where our ion transporters might be of use for physical sciences? Um, I'd be happy to visit with you about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that uh, means he might be interested and he wants to keep it to himself. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> you know, I'd love to sit down and uh, learn more about what, what, what you're doing and what you've demonstrated and, and start a discussion. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. What an invitation. Sure. That's <clears throat> great. So talk more about the patent strategy or the IP strategy. You obviously start with a researcher uh, with some of their intellectual property, whether it's patented or not. Do you then um, kind of expand that IP portfolio? Do you put a specific strategy together to perhaps capture IP from not, not just their colleague researchers, but other competitive areas around the globe? And yeah. Is it global or is it national? It's, um you know, the answer is ab ab absolutely. Uh, you know, again, one of the key assets here in a, in a technology company is, um, is, 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 is IP. And so if there's a way to, uh, we have, um, if, if there's a way to broaden IP license, say originally from an academic institution with IP from other academic institutions, we've done that a lot. If there's a way to license in IP from corporate research groups, we, you know, that's, that's terrific as well. Um, the part of the reason we have a person in uh, Europe is um, because there's a lot of great academic uh, research institutes over in Europe. Uh, the U.S., it turns out, doesn't have a monopoly on innovation. And, um, and, um, and you know, w we want to go meet the great innovators wherever they are globally, frankly. Um, and, uh, and, and so, and, and one of the strategies that we imagine is Paul finding some really interesting work at an institution in Europe that could augment capabilities that exist with um, one or more of our companies over here in the United States. Um, can you name a couple of significant challenges early on in getting the, the technology together with you know, that early leader and, and the researcher. Has there been any consistent um, issues that you have to overcome? Well, um, I mean, there's some, there, there, there's some, some data points that are, um, are you, you know, seem, seem, seem to be persistent. <clears throat> One is that, um, you know, we have found that most academics tend not to be the entrepreneurs that um, are founding, founding the companies and, and driving the companies forward on a full-time basis. Um, and, and, and our data set is of 150 some odd companies in fewer than five instances has the academic left the university. Um, and uh, um, that doesn't mean that there's not uh, an important and critical role for the academic or the academics in the early stages of the company. Usually, um, if we're lucky, there is a postdoc or a couple of postdocs or some PhD students that have been focused on this particular area that are interested in working on this on a full-time basis, and so that's a great way to get started. Um, and uh, But it's important for us to have the researcher involved. We want him or her to own equity in the company. We want him or her to, you know, uh, be answering the phone late at night or on weekends and thinking about how we solve uh, some problem that we're stuck on. And because uh, that always happens, you know, things never go, uh, you, know, you, you know, part of putting a business together is putting a business plan together and then, um, but, um, 
it's it's rarely a linear path, um, as 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 you might write in a business plan. Things never seem to actually uh, happen like that. Um, sometimes uh, technologies don't work commercially; they don't scale commercially. It's going to take a, a, a change in the laws of physics to get it to scale to an economic. You know, that's not going to work. We don't have time for that, um, and. Uh, so then, you know, we have to figure out um, uh, uh, an alternative. One alternative is, you know, we shut the thing down, or the other is we go figure out a way to accomplish what what, what we imagine needs to be accomplished. And um, and uh, and in materials companies, that sort of thing happens all the time. So you have to go find other research, other inventions, other processes, other ways to to get to. Uh, from point A to point B that you didn't necessarily think you, you needed uh, when, when you got started. So that implies that you're somewhat active with the companies during this pro during this time, helping them, leading them, connecting them? Yeah, that's our, um, um, you know, again, the, so the, the sooner we can get professional <laughs> managers on board, the, the better things are for everybody, because uh, our, our um, but but, but we very much like to be involved in the creative parts of these company originations and to be involved in, the, you know, heavily involved in, in recruiting the early team and sorting through the possible um, application areas um, and setting up the company in a way that, um, that we can, you know, imagine there being a, a successful uh, exit. And then we tend to, you know, when we make an initial investment, uh, we'll reserve capital behind that, knowing that that there's likely to be a second round of funding and probably a third round of funding. And the funding tends to be, you know, we sort of think about it in terms of a, a milestone, a trade of, of dollars for milestones. We'll put in a little bit of money because we think we can accomplish um, some significant step that will reduce or eliminate some fundamental risk. Well, that's an important objective. So let's go fund that with whatever the amount of money is, a half a million dollars, a couple of million dollars, and let's go reduce or eliminate that risk. And if we can, if we can do that, you know, then we'll put more money in and, other, and bring in a broader syndicate and put more money in and, uh, and take it to the next step and, 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 and go sort of stepwise knock out fundamental risks, ultimately getting to where we can get product to market and uh, get customers to trade us dollars for the product uh, that, that, that we're trying to make. So uh, <clears throat> leave us tonight with um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, a very fulfilling story where you've taken a company from IP all the way to IPO and why this particular company you have uh, fond memories of um, for whatever reason? Um, so I'll, I'll tell you about a company that um, um, didn't IPO, but it was, um, it was acquired by a public company. And um, <clears throat> this was one that, um, that we helped organize with a couple of scientists from Sandia National Laboratories. And they had, um, Sandia had been a leader in a, in a uh, some uh, semiconductor laser work, and um, um, and uh, uh, two of the folks in that group at Sandia were um, were key members of that group that had really pushed forward an area called a vertical cavity surface emitting laser, uh, or a VIXEL for short. And um, a VIXEL is about the size of a grain of pepper. Uh, modulates at high speeds um, um, and uh, is a is a, a semiconductor laser, and uh, so w we started a company with Rob and Tom, and um, I spent really a year working as the VP of whatever needed to get done that that that, that, that they weren't um, doing. Traveled on a bunch of uh, trips, helped put a corporate partner deal together early on with a. a uh, company called um, Symbol, mm -hmm. which was uh, acquired by maybe um, somebody, Cisco maybe, or Motorola. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
And, and Symbol was the company that invented the, the barcode scanner. You know, all the grocery store uh, Heaney lasers, those are all, you know, Symbol inventions. And, and Symbol was uh, trying to create a scanner on a ring for UPS truck drivers. And, and they really liked our tiny Vixel because it was perfect. You know, didn't use much power, emitted at the right wavelengths. And so we, they were our first customer and partner and, and augmented our equity capital, which is another thing we didn't talk about, but which, you know, everybody, every entrepreneur should try to do is raise um, whatever equity you need, but try to augment that with non-equity sources of capital as best you can. And, um, and, and, and so, um, you know, that got us started down the road at Micro-Optical Devices. And frankly, this is when I was beginning to kind of learn this idea of market discovery. We really had no idea what the big application was for micro-optical devices when we got started. Um, this was potentially one. And then along the way, as we were getting this product <coughs> put together with Symbol, um, Gigabit Ethernet happened. And, um, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, Ethernet speeds needed to get faster and faster, and it was copper was uh, becoming more problematic to send things at uh, higher speeds, and uh, so tiny semiconductor laser light sources that could be made into uh, uh, transceiver modules to, to modulate at high speeds for, for, uh, for datacom was a killer application. And that is a much bigger market than a scanner on a ring for UPS truck drivers. And, um, um, and so, you know, that became our obvious uh, focus. And um, as that was evolving, we became interesting as an acquisition target. We were acquired by a company called MCOR, uh, who was transitioning from an equipment company to a device company. And, um, and they sort of rode the telecom wave a little bit, and we rode the telecom wave with them. And, um, um, and uh, so it, the, 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 you know, the thing that was so gratifying with that is, um, um, you know, this is a company that at its peak in Albuquerque employed, I think, five or 600 people, which in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is a big deal. And, um, and, it's, and, and, and so, you know, I made a lot of friends along the way in that, but, uh, but, the, the, but, but it's, it's really gratifying to, to you know, kind of have a handprint on a, on a company, and I, I wasn't the guy, you know, Rob and Tom did, did, did and, and the other team that was working 80 hours a week did the lion's share of the work, but I, I, I did a little bit, and, and to, be, to be part of that, and, um, and, 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 and to help create a real company is, uh, is, is really a gratifying endeavor. And that was Tom Brennan? Yeah. So that's the relationship that lasts today, given he's now yeah, running Tom, your... Yeah, Tom's the guy that now works with us in Albuquerque at uh, starting companies at Los Alamos. So that relationship is, uh, is uh, uh, continued. Good and strong. Clint, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing some of your wisdom and experiences with us. Um, we're about 7 o'clock now, and so I'd invite everyone to join us for a reception, and then any of you that have to uh, would like to ask uh, Clint a question privately, uh, please do so. Uh, but please join me in thanking him for coming and sharing the wisdom. My, my pleasure. Thank you.